Hello, everybody, and welcome to Create Good today on Thursday morning. Um, we are super excited to have uh, Tamika here with us um, to talk about her very important work and how she has uh, supercharged her volunteers to uh, make it all happen. So um, with that being said, I'm going to let uh, Tamika take it away from here. Thank you so much, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me this morning. I'm super excited to Don and everyone at Create Good for having me here today to speak to you all um, about something that I'm really passionate about. So this is organizing volunteers to become brand superstars. Oops. It would be good if I clicked on the right thing. Um, so I'm Tamika. How did I get here? Um, I didn't start out in the nonprofit world, even though I grew up in a family that was really good about giving back and being involved in the community and everywhere else. But I went to school um, to be a television producer. And it was something that I was always passionate about. I'm from South Carolina, so naturally I'm a storyteller. Um, doing it professionally uh, just kind of heightened that sense of telling stories. And, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, a nonprofit funder, patient advocate, digital content creator, community manager. And, you know, what I know now is everything that I had worked hard and built for was meant for the work that I'm doing now. Uh, so when I talk about being a television producer, uh, I'm still that same girl with a mic in my hand, driving my family and friends crazy. I want to know everyone's story. I see someone on the side of the road. Um, I see someone at a traffic light. I see someone in the grocery store and I wonder what is their story? What makes them tick? I'm just a people person, have always been, and I will always be. I love people. When I was 25, uh, life was good. I was working in Washington, D.C., and all my dreams had come true. All the things that I had built for myself, all the things that my parents had prayed for and really pushed and supported were coming true. And then I went in once I finally got insurance and I had a pelvic exam and I was diagnosed with cervical cancer at 25. And I was scared that I was going to die. I didn't want to die. I had so much more living to do. Um, and I, I literally just thought, this is it. This is all that's going to be left. I survived it. And I am still forever grateful. Uh, it has changed my life in ways that I cannot even begin to tell you. Um, it has uh, taken away my fertility. I, I have so many secondary uh, issues with cancer, but I'm still here, I'm alive, and that is something that I give gratitude every day when I wake up, uh, when I go to sleep, uh, that I'm happy that I am here. So I am a 19-year cervical cancer survivor. Uh, about uh, you know three years into my diagnosis, I, I just felt this kind of pull you know, at this time in 2001, there wasn't really a lot for cervical cancer. And I thought, where are the ribbons for cervical cancer? Where are the people talking about cervical cancer? And through that, you know, it, it was a journey, you know, dealing with my hysterectomy, dealing with the loss of my fertility. But there was this, you know, anger, if I'm honest, of where, where's my teal and white ribbon? Where are the people holding walks for cervical cancer? Why aren't people talking about below the belt cancers as much as they are talking about uh, uh, other cancers? And I wanted to, to find someone, not me, I wanted to find someone who would do that. And so through that, my organization was born Survivor. And at the time, when we first started, it was called Tamika and Friends, and we didn't know what we were doing. It was just literally my friends, how can we support you? How can we help you? Because I was a shell of the person that I once was. And so through a transition, through a couple of years, we, this is where we ended up, survivor, informed, empowered, alive. And it was still that support for women and their families who wanted to be connected to cervical cancer, who wanted to use their story to do something. But in 2013, I thought, now 
the, the, the stigma of HPV is being lifted off of cervical cancer a little bit. I cannot be the only person out here that's telling my story. I knew of another woman, Christine Bays, but I was like, where are the other people sharing their stories? And slowly but surely, as, as we got, uh, you know, when I did this in 2003, uh, <clears throat> we had AOL dial-up, so there wasn't a lot of that, you know, instant connectivity. But as social media came around and people were doing more and more survivor support groups, I started meeting people. People started telling other people about this work that I was doing. And our training, Survivor School, uh, became a part of what we did. And so what I wanted, I wanted to support women with cervical cancer, but I also wanted women <clears throat> and men who would be willing to work together, who would want to come together for um, a greater good. So I'll tell you, when I first did this, I had no idea that I was community building. If you asked me back then, are you building a community? I wouldn't have said that. I would have said that I was building a support network, which is, you know, along the same lines, but community building takes it to another level because this is when you are thinking about leadership. You're thinking about mentorship. You're thinking about growth. You're thinking about whatever your cause is you are building your army, whether it's a small army or a big army, you're building your army of people who will help move your message, move your cause forward. And so that's what it's really about. When you take volunteers and you want to build them into brand stars, how, what, what is the purpose of your community? What are the things that you want them to do? But in doing that, where are you as a leader? Where are you with mentoring them? What is your growth process? Because a lot of times volunteers come in and they're not specialists. They are not people who have been per se trained in whatever you have. So for me, I didn't really have knowledge of cancer beyond, you know, losing a father to cancer when I was a teenager and other family members. But even being directly, you know, um, affected by cancer, I wouldn't say that I was on message for it. So that's where that growth comes in and making sure that when you have volunteers, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier, um, you know, at this conference where they were talking about Habitat International, I think was the name of it. And um, how do we keep people engaged? Whatever your cause is, you want to have a plan for leadership, mentorship, and growth. And so that, that's a big part of it. So when you identify advocates, you want to make sure that there are people who fit well within the structure or that they can grow with you. So you hear me talk about growth a lot because a lot of times we have people come in, they're like, you know, I have a background in marketing. How can I help you? Well, that's an easy way for them to help um, because we all nonprofits need a marketing part. We need, you know, whether it's paid marketing or someone that you get in to volunteer, you want to have your outline already. Where in my organization do I need advocates? Where in my organization do I need people who will come and volunteer and help me take this cause forward? Where are the people that I need to do heavy lifting and do the work of the organization? And so identify those people. You know, for me, uh, do I want people who have been touched by cervical cancer? Yes. But I also want people who just want to give back and apart. So whether it's people who know me personally or the women who are both, or whether it's someone who's just searching online and they find my organization and they want to get involved. And here, when I started my organization, because I was very green to this, and so were my friends, um, we, didn't, we didn't have a plan in place. So we weren't at a place where we said, okay, you know, when someone contacts us and they want to volunteer, here's a one pager or, you know, an online form they can fill out and go. It was kind of just like, hey, I want to volunteer. And I was like, okay. And then if there wasn't an event going on at the time, I didn't have anything going on. And what happened, I would lose potential brand ambassadors. And so what I've learned throughout the years is you've got to be ready. You've got to have a plan in place. You have to have um, a list. You have to have 
a document for them. You have to uh, be fluid a little bit, you, you, you know, knowing what your needs are, especially if you're like a mom and pop, you know, nonprofit and you may work from your home, or if you're in a, what are your realistic capabilities for volunteers and how can they get involved with you? Training. Training is incredibly important. Um, a lot of times when people come in, we're, as a nonprofit, sometimes we're just strapped for time, right? We don't have a lot of time. I know with me, I, if someone comes in and they want to volunteer and I assign them something and we're just like, okay, out the door, go. And it doesn't always work like that. So you have to have training, whether it's what we're doing now virtually or when we're not in the realm of all this COVID-19 stuff, an in-person meeting. Um, but virtual works too. Um, and once you train them, this is where that growth factor comes in again. You have to continue the education. And so what I do and how the, 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 the ambassadors really come in as superstars what we've learned is that we have to continue the education. And how do we do that? We have a monthly call. If we don't need a monthly call, we do quarterly. So for example, over the summer, it's not our busiest time. We know that we don't need monthly calls, but we as leadership, as mentors within our organization, we have made a commitment that if we want these volunteers to really become, you know, the, 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 the people who hype our cause, the people who keep the message out there regionally, because, you know, we do this on an international level. So we have people across the U.S. in different states and territories, but we also have, you know, brand ambassadors who are in other countries. And so it's, it's always interesting to me when I get a photo and here's this person in Australia wearing a survivor t-shirt. Or here's this person, you know, in Honduras, and they, you know, take a photo in our, what we call our survey pose, and they have a bracelet on. These are things that matter. Um, what you want to do is that you want to acknowledge those people, you know, whether it's, you know, they are helping getting your message out there. And if you want them to be on message, on brand, training comes in. Uh, training is just so important. And don't think of training as something that has to be big budget, or it has to um, take a lot of your time, especially if you're small staff. Think of the people who are in your organization, the directors, you know, who um, is in charge of development, who is in charge of community relations. So those are the people who can also do those trainings to do your message. And one of the things, have someone who is in charge of volunteers. So when you get a message that comes in that there's a potential, excuse me, volunteer, uh, there's someone who wants to be a part of the growth process of the organization. They're not necessarily board members, but people who are messengers for the cause. That, that, that's what I think of the survivor ambassadors. You see these people sitting around the table. These are all people who are potential messengers for the cause. So in my um, world with cancer, I also have to remember the social emotional component of it. And the reality is, is that cancer sucks. And cancer is a gift wrapped in barbed wire according to Dr. Heather Palmer. And it means that, you know, there's trauma that comes with cancer. And so in our organization, we also have to deal with people who have dealt, you know, 90% of the people who come in and they want to volunteer, they've dealt directly with the trauma of cancer. And so we have to be cognizant of that. But that's why we've also had volunteers who are social worker, we have volunteers who are clinical psychologists, and they become a part of this community building as well because they're able to help those volunteers on another level where we wouldn't be able to do. So, so we're always great for that. Here's the reality when you're community building. Our moderators, because moderators are key, you have to have moderators. Um, and that is a part of the growth process as well but moderators, they get burnt out. 
uh, how do you keep moderators and community engaged and not burning out? Uh, you all have to do self-care and you have to take breaks. Uh, you have to be realistic about your goals. Um, we uh, do really well about, uh, we have several private groups. So for example, we have our public pages on social media, which is where anybody can follow us, join in the message, but we also have our private groups. So for example, we have uh, I'm a survivor group. Those are for the people who are directly, you know, um, either currently in treatment or they're in the survivorship phase of beginning their life beyond cancer. Um, and so we're able to provide peer-to-peer -peer support directly through that private group. Uh, we also have a private group for Spanish speakers. We have a private group for those who are in uh, the UK. We have a private group, I think, for people in um, uh, Canada. And I think you get where we're going with this. And so each of those groups have moderators. We have expectations that we um, ask of our moderators. And, and, and as a leader, what I've learned is you cannot ask of people what you aren't willing to do. And so one of the things that um, has really helped us is that we've learned that we have to lead by example. So if we're saying we're committed to whatever, we, we you know, need to know that uh, we are not asking them to do anything that we are not wanting to do. And also meet with your moderator. So again, as leadership, it's hard because you're meeting, 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 right? but you have to check in with your moderators. How are you doing? How can I support you? Are we finding that there are any new issues that are coming up in our communities that we as leadership need to address? Support your moderators, thank them. Um, you know, I'm not saying you have to go out quarterly and send a gift, but thanking someone for doing this goes a long way. And maybe it's the Southerner in me, but I definitely think that you keep your moderators happy. They're more in tune to keep the communities engaged and going as well. Right before I started this, I noticed my moderator in our largest group, uh, she posted something, I think it's National Book Day or something like that. It seems like there, there's a day for something all the time now, but we definitely need those um, because we're all sitting at home. But I, 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 I actually sent her a message while I was waiting for this panel to start like, oh, I didn't know about National Book Day. Thank you so much because we have a content calendar that we do, but sometimes, you know, if things pop up, they have, you know, the leisure to go in and post those. Um, so I was really happy about that. But so stay tuned into your community, keep them engaged. Um, and as I'm going through these, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. We're gonna have time at the end of this um, for Q&A. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions that are out there. So here's what you need to know. Uh, your cause has a story that needs to be heard. And people don't always you, you, you know, think about that, but you, you, you have literally, you, the importance of uh, sharing your story is you can bring more people to your cause. You can increase funding, you can increase engagement. And what we know for sure that power is visibility. And so if you are able to, to, to bring visibility to your cause, you're able to take it into the next level. And so no matter what your topic is, know that it is important for your story to get out there. And you see at the end of this, share your sto story and join our survivor community. Because at the end of the day, the community is, is really what you're building. And so uh, this is a video um, from a comedian, but it, it, it's one of my favorite things to share because I think the importance of finding your why and implementing effective storytelling is key to all the work that we're doing. And so, Brian, could you play this video? This is called, How Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what. The key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at three o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. 
uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So three o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular, I'm about to show you a clip to, we were in, uh, we were in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid, I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that says. So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, that video. It really is one of my uh, favorite videos to share. And, you know, um, someone that I work with, um, because you have to have partnerships. And so I work with the National uh, Vaccination HPV Roundtable and uh, Dr. Nora Brewer, who chairs it. And one of the things that um, he shared with me one day, he was just like, oh, you have this video. I'd like to use it, um, you know, because as a scientist, as a researcher, I have the data, but we don't tell the story. And that really resonated with me, especially when I'm thinking about, you know, what will, you know, my side of things be? Uh, how will I support the larger cause? Because, you know, there are always partner organizations out there that you can, um, you know, work with or, or, or start a, part, a relationship with and start working with them. How do you do that? And so when I realized that there were all these great, you know, clinicians and researchers and everyone doing this work, but we need stories. And that's really where I'm like, I'm a storyteller. I can train other women how to be storytellers, but how do I get them to lift this veil off and share it publicly? So there's one thing to share it within our community, right? But to really um, make ways and take our cause further, we have to begin sharing it publicly. And so that's where that 
additional layer of partnership and growth comes in. And so we wanted to support that. And so one of the, uh, the ways that we do that is that we are shame resilient. Uh, if you're familiar with Brene Brown, who a lot of us love, she talks about bravery. And so shame resilient, really, our shame resilient campaign really came from reading the teachings of Brene Brown. And so in this first photo that you see, we have Allie, uh, who was like me. She was a young woman who was diagnosed with cervical cancer. She lost her fertility. And when I first said I wanted to do this kind of virtual touring uh, gallery, I, I said to the women, you pick what you want to do. Um, here, here, here's what I'm thinking. The theme is shame resilient. Um, I want you to show in a way how you're resilient of lifting, and you've lifted that veil of shame and you're putting a message how you've been impacted by cancer, especially by people who think that cervical cancer only happens to a certain type of woman, or maybe even that, you know, you get cervical cancer, you have surgery, it's no big deal, and you're fine. What has, how has that impacted you? And so this is what uh, one of the beautiful, poignant storytelling photos that came from that. On the other side, we had a hashtag, I'm a survivor. Uh, campaign. And this is Lillian. Her mother died um, from cervical cancer. And she wanted people to know that my mother was taken away from me because of that. And her idea was, I'm going to bring a photo of my mother and I'm going to hold it up. And she wanted to wear a survivor t-shirt. And so that was her way of saying it. You see on the second photo with Lillian holding the photo of her mother, we included hashtags. Now, I will tell you, um, I was slow on this social media band right now. I'll never forget one of my coworkers like, you got to get on Facebook. And I remember thinking, no, that's just for college students. Of course, this is when it was like just really coming out. Um, and then Instagram and so on. And it has been such a game changer for us. Um, this hashtag, I'm a survivor, and just our hashtag survivor. Uh, what I do at night when I'm up, I love to go on Instagram and search the hashtag survivor. And that's really how I get potential brand ambassadors for the cause. One, people who are already using the survivor hashtag, which means that they know our cause, they're interested in it, they believe in it so much so that they use the hashtags in their posts, some, some daily. Uh, sometimes when they go and they get treatment or whatever, but they're using it. So that my antenna is already up. Then if we see someone, okay, they're using the hashtag, they're really involved, they seem very knowledgeable oh, to our mission, to our cause, maybe they would be a great candidate for survivor school. And so people who graduate go through our survivor school training. Um, and later, I'll show you our, a piece, uh, just a cover from our handbook. They kind of tick off the things on the list, the checklist that we, our expectations of survivor ambassadors, which AKA our brand ambassador rock stars. Um, these are the people who use survivor ambassador. And a funny story really quickly, uh, there was a woman, Holly, who sadly is no longer with us, but she came to us because she saw the survivor ambassador hashtag. She saw what these women were doing. She wanted to be a part of it. So she started using the survivor ambassador hashtag before even going to survivor school, which wasn't a big thing. She ended up going to survivor school. She ended up, actually, I hired her um, to work with us, but it just goes to show you that casting that net out, seeing what, uh, interest there is, and then bringing people in, you never know the level of how they will begin their involvement with your organization. And so that's just one way. So um, I have another video that I want to show you. This uh, is from a woman, Lisa. And this is the story that Dr. Donald Brewer, who you saw that slide, um, when he said, you know, we had the data, but we didn't share the story. Uh, this now is, this is a woman, Lisa, who's no longer with us. Um, she came to us already dying of cervical cancer. Uh, she wanted to show the world what cervical cancer had done to her. She also wanted her story to be used so that people would understand that this was a very real cancer. And so if we could just play that video. 
My name is Lisa Moore. I'm 30 years old and I live in South Bend, Indiana. And I was diagnosed with stage 1B1 adenocarcinoma of the cervix at 26. No one deserves this. Bowel obstructions are not fun. Neph tubes are not fun. Tubes in your stomach aren't fun. The side effects of the treatment are not fun. If something like this is preventable, I don't understand why people don't want to prevent it. If it was a leukemia vaccine or breast cancer or prostate cancer or anything not related to sex, there'd be no question. Cancer sucks. It takes and takes and takes. And majority of the time, it takes everything and kills you. If I can help somebody else not go through this, that's probably the best thing I have to offer at this point. So in watching Lisa's video, and now Lisa's video, like I said, has been shared around the world. What I really want you to think about is that how will your content shine above and beyond? So these are the unique stories that are within your work, whether it's a graphic with a quote, whether it's a direct personal story of someone who's been involved um, in your organization. When we do the Q&A portion of this, I'd love to hear how you're sharing compelling stories and content. Um, but, but, but the world is hungry for content 24-7. Right now, while everyone is at home and we're on our devices more than ever, this is the time to not only show off your brand ambassador, but also let your future brand ambassadors see what the work they could be a part of. Um, and so, so this is the time to start thinking about that. Really think about how you can step it up and show the world just the, the amazing work that you're doing. So delegating responsibility, you know, mobilizing online community to take concrete steps to increase awareness, delegating responsibility and finding the gaps in your organization that need improvement. And so really, when we went through survivor school, we started, you know, as a way to empower. We wanted to inspire, empower, remind these women that not everyone survives this disease. And so you're alive. So let's take this message forward and, 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 and use your personal impact story to show the world what it is like to live with cervical cancer. And so we gave them responsibility. And we made it official by actually graduating them from survivor school. So they get certificates. Um, and we wanted them to know that we take this seriously, right? As leaders, we take this very serious. You know, yes, it's cute to print these out, to, to give them to you, to take this. You know, it can be a bit cheeky, but they also know that this is very serious for us. We are delegating responsibility. We want them to know that each individual person that you see, and this is just our most recent graduate, so we hold a school every year, um, but, but we want them to know that there is power in the certificate, just like there's power in you. And we, we are saying that because we're alive, we have a responsibility to share this. And when we bring you to, a, to survivor school, we want you to honor the investment, the investment that we've made to yourself, into you, the, the, the investment that you've made to yourself, uh, you, you know, had to travel, whether it's, you know, just from your house to here or whether you came from another country or whatever, honor the investment. And so this is the start of how we begin delegating responsibility uh, to these people who attend our survivor school. Um, I like to think of them as partners in purpose. That means that you can help elevate and expand your cause and that it's not just about you, it's about these partners in purpose who understand your cause, they wanna move it forward. And it's a really nice sentiment uh, to, to think of brand ambassadors also as partners because in actuality, that's actu actually what they are. Um, but with that comes accountability, you know, uh, it, it's crucial to holding volunteers accountable uh, to have responsibility they have been given as brand ambassadors. It's key to the success, the visibility, and the longevity of a cause. But 
you have to understand that all goes back to leadership. And so one of the things that we learned along the way is that, you know, we had to create a handbook and we wanted people to know that we're asking you to be accountable, but here we are telling you. And so not, this doesn't work for everyone, but I really wanted to give an example of how we do that. Um, and so we do it through our Survivor Ambassador handbook. We actually have them sign virtually in our private group. Everyone has to sign. We have one woman that's not on social media, so she's, you know, electrically, electronically signed it to us. Um, but uh, we want people to know these are our expectations. In the handbook also, which is really helpful, we have tips for contacting the media. We have tips for holding in person um, uh, events. We have um, uh, what are different awareness week and awareness month. So it also has key talking points. So when in doubt, go to your handbook. That when in doubt, go to your handbook. And so it's something, you know, tangible uh, that they have that they can refer to for key messaging points, but also our expectations of them and reminders of what we want them to do. Um, so I have managing conflict here. Uh, so uh, it, it may sound, uh, but, but you know, when you get a group of people together, people don't always um, get along all the time or they don't necessarily agree on things. So you have to also be ready to uh, manage conflicting opinions, priority goals, time commitments of, you know, not only just admin, but the people in the community. And so it just helps uh, for everything to go better. You know, um, people uh, have opinions and sometimes those opinions don't line up with the organization. So if you have a plan to manage content, um, manage the conflict, it will help you when one of these things arise. And it's, it's you know, not the fun part of doing this work, but it definitely is something that is a part of it. So visibility and credibility. Remember earlier I talked about um, the hashtag that we use, Survivor. And so this is just, and it's very timely from Becky Wallace, who is one of our recent Survivor graduates that you saw in that picture holding um, uh, uh, the certificate from Survivor School. So she writes, see the bulge protruding from my chest, that's my port my lifeline to the poison that gets pumped into my body every three weeks. I have already had to be semi-quarantined since November. She talked about her children not being able to go to their classes, but now she wants to say, now throw COVID-19 in the mix and the stakes are even higher for people like me, meaning people who are cancer patients. Instead of griping and complaining, enjoy this time with your family, you know, yada, yada, yada. She's in California, um, but, she wanted people to know that, you know, my life is dependent on this at a time when the world is staying before the most, for the most part, you know, shelter in place, stay at home, wash your hands, wear a mask, do gloves or whatever. Uh, this was a way for her to share her story, what was happening to her, but she brought our calls into it simply by using the survivor hashtag. It's the second hashtag that's there. Um, and so, by now, people are familiar with her being a survivor ambassador. She also did something once she graduated from survivor school, she changed her Instagram name. And so it reflects, like, I think it's like Becky Underground Survivor or something like that. But, but, but we also have our ambassadors include that they are, are, are a survivor ambassador in, our, in, our, in their social media handles. And so that's something that, um, also brings visibility to the organization, but brings credibility to this volunteer who is a brand ambassador for the organization. I hope that makes sense. Um, so with that, we also have to celebrate success, right? So one thing with volunteers, I said, thank them, but let's also celebrate the success. So here we have Maria, who just recently celebrated 20 years of survivorship. But along the 20 years, she's raised thousands of dollars for this organization. She's volunteered hundreds of hours. She has um, held things at her office. She's held uh, survivorship meetups, community meetups, all this other stuff. So Maria was awarded what, our Survivor Champion Award. And it's just our way of saying, we see you. 
We see your visibility. We see your credibility. We see your commitment to this cause. We want to celebrate you. And so celebrating is a way of acknowledging and it, it, it also gives a little healthy competition among the volunteers because then they all want a chance at the Survivor Championship Award. And so how did we get here? We literally got here through planting seeds. We nurtured those seeds, we harvested those seeds, and we repeat. And you have to repeat, why? Because if you don't repeat, then what happens if, you know, the, 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 the group of volunteers now all, I, I want to go back to school, I'm starting a family, or I'm just too busy, or just whatever, they don't have time. So you want to keep this on repeat. You want to bring people in, you want to plant the seeds, nurture, harvest, repeat. You want to grow and build your community. And also you want to take those senior um, uh, volunteers and make them into mentors for this, this next group on the repeat cycle. So let's create good together. I want to hear from you. I want to hear how you're creating good. I want to hear how you're mobilizing and building your communities. I want you to keep in touch with me. Um, I'd love for you to share today. And so uh, we can open up the Q&A chat and I am happy to answer any questions. We're good on time. Awesome. Thank you, Tamika. Um, I, so there's a couple of questions here in the uh, questions area. Um, for everyone listening in, if you want to ask a question, um, you know, ask it out loud, uh, go and use the hand raise feature, and then I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, some here in the questions area. Um, so I see a question. What are some specific strategies for how you identify the people you think would be good ambassadors? Um, so for us, it, it really is for me and my leadership team. Um, I have a four, four, four to five people on my leadership team that work in various levels. You know, someone is our lead survivor ambassador. The other person is our lead um, advocacy educator. And so my personal way of doing it is searching for hashtags. I want to see who's using not only our hashtag, but the hashtag cervical cancer. I want to see who's in tune, excuse me, and already talking about messaging so that I can help elevate them to another level and do it. Um, there's some people who may not be as out there as that. And so maybe um, we have someone who travels around, they go to a lot of different American Cancer Society events in their state, and so they meet people there. Um, so it, it really is, and, and, and casting that net means also, um, when you identify people, put it out there, like we're looking for volunteers, but be specific. Um, sometimes I create just a little, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, a form, a Google form, or just whatever type of form for people, and just something very short, you know, so you can send it out to your database and say, hey, we're looking for these volunteers, but hey, let me know, uh, let us know if you have any other specific talents that you may be willing to give to the organization. You know, there may be someone who is an event planner, you know, a lot of times, you know, we've been lucky to say, oh, here's a professional event planner that wants to volunteer our time. So really, you, you know, you can post and share about what you're seeking as a volunteer, but also be open um, to, 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 to other ways to do it. And word of mouth still is very, very helpful. Um, if you're looking for people, share, share exactly what you're looking for. Could you give examples of the type of monthly quarterly training you do for volunteers? Sure. Um, so on our monthly quarterly calls, um, that's my time to check in with them. How are you doing? How's life? Also, it's my time to say, um, this is what we need from you. And so we also offer challenges. Um, so every blue moon, we, we don't have them on a specific schedule. So like right now during COVID-19, um, while we're not having in person in-person event, we're not per se speaking on panels out in other places. Um, the lead survivor ambassador and I got together and we're like, we're going to uh, do a challenge. And you set the challenge for however long, sometimes, sometimes they're prizes, sometimes it's just bragging rights, sometimes it's just everyone checking off, yeah, I did it. Um, and so within those challenges, uh, we, uh, like this 
particular one is like, how will you stay connected to our message? How will you, you know, make sure our message is out there and not getting lost in the midst of COVID-19. So for example, um, one of the things that we're sharing today is what a woman posted on her page. She's just like, you know, I work for UPS. She was like, I'm washing my hands. I'm social distancing. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm going into work, making sure that we're getting packages out, not only to the general public, but to healthcare people on the front, front line who needs it. But what she did was she was like, I'm scared. I'm scared that my pre-existing condition of being a survivor will put me at greater risk and so she gets checked off um, for doing it so in our private group we post a challenge um I, the last challenge we did was we're like now's a great time to go on youtube like all our videos comment like all our videos because right now more visibility we put a lot of stuff on facebook we put it on instagram and that's great that people are commenting there but we also want people to comment on whatever we post on our actual website and on youtube because our youtube doesn't get enough love and so we issued a challenge and we we're like you know once you do it come back here click done and so sometimes we just you know mail out a little something to people sometimes it's just you know adding to their advocacy footprint that they did this um but also if you know guidelines have recently been changed for cervical cancer so those calls are also a good time for us to talk about what um is new on the forefront what we want them to learn you know we shouldn't still be talking about pelvic exams we shouldn't talk about cervical cancer screening PAP testing, HPV testing, HPV vaccination. So being very clear on the message and also if there's any change to the messaging, that's what we do in those calls. Um, or if there are any changes within our survivor ambassadorship program, that's a good time for me to talk about those things on the calls. I don't always leave the calls um, and that's where it's good having other people. Sometimes we have guest speakers, whether <clears throat> It's someone who's educating or it's someone who's supporting. Um, we've had anywhere from people coming on to talk about how cancer is a trauma. We've had people come talk about pelvic floor issues, um, sexuality and cancer, um, all kinds of stuff. So it's just a good way to keep people uh, together. Um, how do you handle someone who really wants to be a vocal advocate, but you've realized it may not be the best fit for them or your organization? Oh God, it's so hard and it's gonna sound awful. Um, these are people that you have to have tough conversations with and I will be the first to say, I haven't always handled it in the right way, um, but it's a learning experience. You know, um, We've definitely had people who have been off topic, very loud, um, I've had um, doctors see those posts and send me text messages like, have you seen this? What's going on? Um, you have to handle it directly, though, because sitting to the side waiting and hoping that that person will stop it, they won't do it. Um, it this is your organization you are in a leadership position, so you have to do it. And that means we have to have tough conversations. I actually had to reach out to someone and tell them like, you're a cervical cancer survivor. You can always use the survivor hashtag, but you can't use the survivor ambassador hashtag. And this is the reason why I hope you understand. And it was a difficult uh, time. It wasn't happy. We've had other people who we had some bl bad blowback from it. They wrote some not so nice things on social media um, because of it. But because I stand on the credibility and visibility of not only myself, but the organization, I knew we would um, withstand it. So it all is about how you react to it. You know, we didn't write this whole big public thing. We just knew that it would kind of um, die out on its own and that person actually wasn't credible. Um, but but it's one of those things that you, you definitely have to address it. And this is where also building your posse is, a, is, is really important because if you do that, those people will come and drown out that message. So one of the things that we, when we have our private groups, we can say, hey, this person is over here they're screaming loud, they're doing this, yada, yada, yada. As ambassadors, we need you all to step up and make sure that you're using the hashtag so that when that person used that hashtag for you know a message that's not so kind, it'll be further down and will elevate all of our positive messages.
All right, Sarah, you're on. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Tamika, I'm curious how you kind of balance the um, the need for you know those those traditional kind of in person like event volunteers and stuff like that um, with the brand ambassador side. Uh, my my organization is you know pretty old school in how we think about volunteers and. I think this this period of time is a prime example of why we need to move to more more of what you're talking about. So we're just mm -hmm. not getting any engagement from volunteers now that we're not able to have events in person. So I'm curious if you if you typically kind of start with the the brand brand ambassador um, training and, and then move them to being like, hey, we have this need at this event or something like that, or how you kind of balance those different different needs of volunteers. Yeah, so we, we started focusing hard on brand. We, we, we really realized, and again, I was, I was old school. I was like very much like, oh, we don't need to do this. And I will tell you, like it has been a saving grace that we do so much online. We do in-person per in events as well, but it, it's so needed and it's taught me like, this is why you have to be fluid a little bit. You have to be open to that. You have to change your entire structure at your organization but you just never know when something is going to come in and impact you in such a way um we are also in place of those um uh in-person events we're doing a lot of virtual events and we're, we're we're just going on the fly with it you know we have people who like let's do this let's do that you know we've had happy hours now we're having a tea time on sunday this sunday we're doing um a makeup tutorial. Uh, we have someone in our organization who is a makeup artist. So, and, and this is not for everyone, but we're also having things like, you know, how to volunteer and how to still advocate for a cause uh, while we're on, while we're all quarantined. And so mm -hmm. really um, doing whatever you can do right now to build engagement is important. And here's the other thing. So I was talking to my leadership last week and we're saying like these are great so even once this is over and we're back doing in-person events we still need to hold these virtual events not at the level that obviously we're doing now but this could happen it could come back again um or we may be in a place where we for whatever reason can't have uh in-person events and so we need to do this so i think it's really about having a plan in place it'll never be 100 percent of what could happen but if you have a good launching pad for what you could do it'll help and i would just keep going back to your organization and and and, and telling them like look this is a sign of the time excuse me this is this is why we need to have a virtual component to our organization mm -hmm. great that's really helpful thank you you're welcome we know our why but not our what recommendations on running activities and why talent yeah, I, Claire, I really think like, you know, so here's our why, but what's the what, you know, this is where serving your community comes in handy, like really reaching out to them and seeing, you know, what the skill set is, what people can do. Um, how can they take your message and personalize it, right? And so that's a part of it also. Like, how do they take their message and they personalize it? Because you want to think about here. Okay, so here is the organization. Here's the organization's message. Here's everyone under it. But what they're doing, they're lifting it and they're pushing it out. So you want to think about who you have. And so it's really vital to knowing who's in your community, doing a survey of who's there, who's willing to share, um, what they're willing to give. Um, I think that is really important. Sometimes, you know, there's someone I've been talking to or following them on social media forever. I meet them at an event. We start talking. I'm like, oh, I didn't know you. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, I do nutrition. Now that I'm a cancer survivor, I'm, you know, focusing specifically on nutrition for people in oncology. And it's like, oh, that's great, <laughs> you know? But so it's really um, finding out um, who's in that community and what talents and skills that they have. Like the woman who is a makeup artist and we were like, oh, you wanna do a, a, a virtual event for, for us doing makeup? And she was like, sure, you know? And so that's another way for us, like we'll be doing makeup 
but we'll also be asking, how's everyone doing? Uh, did you see that article in the New Yorker um, about cervical cancer in Alabama and how Alabama has the highest incident, incidence of cervical cancer? And there's a Medicaid issue in Alabama. So how can we meet more people virtually right now in Alabama and get them you know, on board with our cause and to do something in Alabama once all of this is lifted, go there and try to make a change. What's the biggest lesson or a few lessons you've learned while working with volunteers? Um, you can't make everybody happy <laughs> that volunteers come and go, that when you get a really good volunteer that you got to thank them, you've got to stroke their ego. You And not because they want that, because you want to show appreciation. You want to let them know, like, I appreciate you. This cause needs you. This message needs you. I need you. So I appreciate you so much. So that's really like a big part of it. But in knowing that, you know, some people are not going to be happy. They're going to walk away. And we were so small when we first started. And a lot of ways, we, I guess we still are, but we were really small. And so when someone wanted to walk away, I didn't want to let them leave. Um, and that's a mistake. Um, everyone has a time and you have to let them go when they want to go. But when you have a really, really, really good volunteer, you've got to appreciate them. Yeah, I kind of had a, a follow up to that one, to me, again, it's, it's, yeah, it's definitely connected to what you just said. I was wondering, um, volunteer churn is kind of an ever present thing. How much do you think about that? Like, do you only worry about it if it gets bad? Or, you know, if you kind of have one up, so do you think about it much? Or you just, is that part of the process? Yeah, I think like you have to always think about volunteers. We live in a world where funding is really tight. And so volunteers really matter. And um, I just think that's where I go to that, you know, plant, nurture, grow, harvest, repeat, you really have to um, kind of always like bringing in, even if it's just one volunteer, so you have to think about it like that. I'm not saying like you have to bring in like a crop of volunteers all the time, even if it's just one volunteer here and there, um, but, but volunteers should always be something that is, you know, when you're thinking about what are the current goals of the organization, you know, volunteers should definitely be in the top 10 or five or whatever. So I just want to thank, you know, Create Good and Don and everyone there for um, inviting me to share with you all. I hope it was really helpful. Um, please keep in touch. Follow me on social media. I do post more than just survivor stuff, though, so I'm warning you. <laughs> um, but I uh, am, like, really, like, just happy with this check out my nonprofit uh i am a survivor's uh instagram and other social media handles um it uh, i'm i'm super proud of it it's my little baby my little engine just keeps going 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 and um if you can do your part to not only help us uh in cervical cancer but whatever you do in the world continue to create good i just love that so much and i'm sharing it forth with me bye thank you